Today, the Matt Wall Show, the media has done everything it can to discredit and bury the story, but we now have absolute confirmation that disturbing diary passages from Joe Biden's daughter are 100% authentic, and they reveal some very distressing information about the President of the United States and his behavior with his own daughter. Also, the latest chat GPT update brings us one big step closer to our dystopian sci-fi future, and that is a bad thing, in my opinion. And Jerry Seinfeld explains why privilege shouldn't be considered a dirty word. All of that and more today on the Matt Wall Show. Once again, Pure Talk is investing in their customers with their own money and without charging you an extra penny. I'm happy to announce that Pure Talk is now providing international roaming to over 50 countries. As you plan your summer travel, make sure your wireless provider has you covered at home and abroad. Pure Talk already puts you on America's most dependable 5G network, but now they're offering coverage in over 50 countries as well. Enjoy the freedom of unlimited talk, text, and ample 5G data for just 20 bucks a month with Pure Talk. This is a deal that's hard to beat, costing you less than half of what you'd pay with other networks. Not only is their U.S. customer service team ready to assist you with a seamless switch, but they also have fantastic savings on the latest iPhones and Androids. Ready to make a smart switch? Join my cell phone company, Pure Talk, and start saving today. Visit puretalk.com slash Walsh to explore their offers. When you make the switch, you'll in, enjoy an additional 50% off your first month. Don't miss out on this opportunity to save on wireless at home and abroad. Visit puretalk.com slash Walsh. That's puretalk.com slash Walsh today. If you follow conservative media closely, you may be aware of this, or still maybe not, but there is a document that exists which directly implicates the president of the United States in highly inappropriate and deeply disturbing behavior with an underage girl. I'm talking about the diary of Joe Biden's daughter, Ashley, which is treated as such a non-story in many circles that many people still don't know anything about it whatsoever. That's how suppressed this story has been. So here's a refresher. Back in the spring of 2020, Joe Biden's daughter, Ashley, moved out of a two-bedroom home that her friend was renting in Delray Beach, Florida. She had been staying in Delray Beach for rehab, but as the election approached, she headed out of state to Philadelphia. When Ashley Biden left, the friend who was renting the house found a new tenant to replace her, an ex-girlfriend named Amy Harris. Now, Harris very quickly discovered that several of Ashley Biden's personal items had been left behind. Not long afterwards, in early September of 2020, someone called Project Veritas' tip line and left this voicemail. There's some dramatic music in the background, which was added by Project Veritas, but it's, of course, the what's actually being said that is important here. So listen. Hi there. I'm calling from Florida. My family, their friend who owns a house down here in Palm Beach, was renting it out. I don't know how, it, but this is a while back. But anyway, somebody, a new renter moved in and Ashley Biden was staying in this room and they found her diary, all of her clothes, luggage, pills. Anyway, um, diary is pretty crazy. Um, I think it's worth taking a look at. It's not a joke. It's real. And um, I'd love to get it into your hands. Now, at the time, even though they paid tens of thousands of dollars for it, Project Veritas decided not to publish, publish the diary themselves. But not long after that tip came in, just weeks before the presidential election, a blog called The National File published what it described as the complete text of the diary. They wrote, quote, National File obtained this document from a whistleblower who was concerned the media organization that employs him would not publish the materials in the final days before the presidential election. Now, the diary published by the National File contained this handwritten passage, quote, hypersexualized at a young age. What is this due to? Was I molested? I think so. I can't remember specifics, but I do remember trauma. I remember not liking the Woolzak's house. I remember somewhat being sexualized with a cousin. I remember having sex with friends at a young age. Showers with my dad, probably not appropriate. Being turned on when I wasn't supposed to be. Now, there are other distressing passages as well, but in the diary, but, but that's the big one. And this diary immediately became the, the second highly revealing item left behind by a member of the Biden family just prior to the 2020 election. There was also, of course, Hunter Biden's laptop that was abandoned at the computer repair store as you probably recall. And in both cases, Democrats' strategy was the same. They simply denied the materials were authentic. 
Hunter Biden's laptop, we were told, was Russian disinformation. Facebook and Twitter censored it and punished anyone who posted it. In the case of the diary, we were told that uh, its authenticity couldn't be verified. They probably would have called that Russian disinformation too if anyone had bothered to press them on it, but no one really did press them on it for several years, even though it was a very strange claim to make for a couple of reasons. For one thing, there wasn't a clear denial from Ashley Biden herself. You'd think that if it wasn't her diary, she would say so. Additionally, in the following months, Joe Biden's FBI raided the homes of several Project Veritas journalists. They hit James O'Keefe with a pre-dawn raid. They also seized O'Keefe's uh, electronic devices and started searching through them before a federal judge ordered the government to stop. Now, needless to say, it's a very heavy-handed law enforcement response if we're simply talking about a random stolen diary. It begins to make more sense only if the diary does, in fact, belong to Ashley Biden. In that case, since Joe Biden seized the FBI as his personal police force, you could see why he'd send a SWAT team after Project Veritas. Now, in the logic business, this is known as a deduction, and it's strictly forbidden in the so-called fact-checking industry. The self-described fact-checkers at Snopes, for example, declared that it was unproven that Ashley Biden's diary had been verified. They also said that it was unproven that Ashley Biden had accused Biden of uh, Joe Biden of inappropriate conduct in the diary. Snopes included this line in their fact check, quote, the authenticity of photographs purported to, to be from a diary is a separate question from the factual existence of a diary. Now, it's not even really clear what that means. It's basically just a bunch of words to confuse people as much as possible. And for its part, PolitiFact ran a similar fact check, asserting that, quote, the FBI did not confirm any contents of Ashley Biden's diary. They had the big red false sign lit up on their patented truth meter So the leftists could point to it and say, see, the story's fake. It says right there. Now, this is a clever tactic that PolitiFact uses whenever they do a fact check on a story they know is bad for Democrats. What they do is that in instead of fact checking the question people are interested in, which is whether, in this case, whether Ashley Biden's diary and the leaked passages are real, they chose to fact check the specific statement that the FBI had confirmed the contents of the diary. Which is, not, which is not the point. We don't really care what the FBI said. We care about whether the diary is real, whether the FBI admits it or not. And because the FBI hadn't explicitly confirmed it, they published a highly misleading fact check suggesting that the diary is fake. And PolitiFact did something similar when AOC did that infamous photo shoot where she wept in front of an empty parking lot outside of an immigrant detention facility. PolitiFact called the story false on the grounds that AOC was, in fact, standing in front of an empty road, not a parking lot. Incredibly, both Snopes and Polit PolitiFact stuck to the claim that the diary wasn't real or authenticated, even after two Florida residents pleaded guilty to stealing and distributing items, including an item described in court documents as, quote, a personal diary that belonged to a relative of a then former government official who was running for national office. And as if that wasn't enough, the fact checkers at Snopes stuck to their guns, even after Ashley Biden herself called into Project Veritas to admit that the diary was hers and that she wanted it back. And she did this on tape. Watch. At this point, and I don't mean to, I, I don't want to have to get Secret Service involved in this, right? Because it just is, it, it's a whole process. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I am Ashley Biden. It is my stuff. So if you could just skip all of that over, I would really appreciate it. I know you sent a picture to my husband with a camera <clears throat> and mm -hmm. a few other things that are mine as well. So that would be really great. Where is a good place uh, for him to meet you? Now, that's pretty compelling evidence that the diary is Ashley Biden's. I mean, it's, it's confirmation. She confirmed it. That's it. it. There we go. It's hard to think of, of more compelling evidence than that. And it's been available for a long time. Nevertheless, for the past several years, pretty much the entire national news media and the fact checkers who exist to censor people on, on the Internet and on behalf of the Democratic Party pretended that the diary was still unverified. Even with Ashley Biden herself saying, that's mine. Uh, you know, Ashley Biden on tape saying, hey, that's my diary somehow was not enough for them. Neither were the pre-dawn SWAT team raids to get the diary back or the guilty pleas from the people who sold it. That finally changed only a couple of weeks ago when Ashley Biden put her admission in writing. She sent a letter to the federal court uh, judge overseeing the sentencing process for Amy Harris, the woman who found the diary, and the letter from Ashley Biden was recently unsealed. And in the letter, Ashley Biden admits the diary is hers. She says that its release caused her pain she talks about having PTSD and trauma and urges the judge to sentence Harris to prison. And additionally, Ashley Biden writes vaguely about grotesque lies concerning the diary. She implies that people are distorting her stream of consciousness thoughts. 
She claims her words are being misinterpreted, that people are lobbing false accusations and so on. Now, she didn't get more specific than that, but she didn't have to. The judge bought it and ruled that uh, Harris's decision to sell the diary was, quote, despicable and consequently very serious. And Harris received a, a month in prison, three months home confinement, confinement, and three years probation. Now, by comparison, we should note that a judge in Arizona just sentenced a woman to probation, only probation, no prison time, for attempting on multiple occasions to murder her husband by poisoning his coffee with bleach. So prison time for stealing a diary, probation for attempted premeditated murder. That tells you how radioactive this document is. The left understands that Joe Biden showered with his daughter, potentially contributed to her psychological problems in adulthood. They recognize that the line, was I molested, I think so, in the context of that passage, could very well refer to Joe Biden. We don't know for sure, but there is very good reason to be suspicious. And so they need to suppress it and punish the people who published it. And that effort to suppress the story continues today, even after Ashley Biden has admitted in writing that the diary is real. Snopes has finally uh, updated its fact check because they had no other choice. But elsewhere, the campaign to downplay the diary continues. Take a look at this remarkable sentence in the New York Times summarizing the case. Quote, the sentencing of Ms. Harris reflects the seriousness of the government's efforts to deter people from interfering in elections. That includes former President Donald J. Trump, who is awaiting federal trial in Washington on charges of trying to subvert the outcome of the 2020 race. So you got that? Publishing firsthand information about the president's inappropriate behavior with his own daughter is now considered interfering in elections. So basically, you're not allowed to present any information that makes the Democrats' candidate uh, look bad. Whether you're Vladimir Putin or the woman who happens to rent the room where Ashley Biden used to live, doesn't matter. You don't get to make Joe Biden look bad. Those are the rules. Now, of course, if you're a rational person, you would say that the opposite, if anything, is the case. Like if you became aware that Joe Biden behaved inappropriately with his daughter and you didn't alert the public to the fact, you would then be interfering in the election by withholding information that the public has a right to know about the, war, the most powerful man in the world. Now, um, that's, you know, there's not enough irony uh, in the world to account for the fact that on top of all this, the same people making this argument also want us to believe that it's a major earth-shattering scandal for Donald Trump to have paid off some porn star. We're supposed to care that he didn't account for the transaction in his books or whatever. They're saying Donald Trump should be imprisoned for that. But, but that's not election interference in their minds. Imprisoning the leading presidential candidate during a presidential election isn't election interference, but reporting on the writings of the president's daughter is somehow election interference. Now, you've already seen all those videos of Joe Biden caressing and getting weirdly close to underage girls in public. Uh, they're all over the internet. And the left has tried to downplay all of those, saying that uh, you know that's just how Joe Biden is. But there's no downplaying the fact that he showered with his daughter and clearly and understandably upset her greatly in the process. And like Hunter Biden, she hasn't had the easiest life, quite possibly because, in part, of Joe Biden's actions. Unlike some of Donald Trump's accusers, the other thing we know is that Ashley Biden had no reason to lie in her diary. You don't, you don't lie in your own diary in writings you don't want anyone to see. She had no financial motivation to write that she may have been molested or that Joe Biden showered with her or any of that. The fact that the media covered up this story for so long makes it clear that they understand exactly how damning it is. Whatever you think of Donald Trump uh, paying off uh, some porn star, there's just no doubt that this is infinitely worse. It's now undeniable that the President of the United States does not belong anywhere around children. The, the words of his own daughter make that clear. And a society that still cared about children, even a little, would ensure that he never steps foot in the White House again. Now let's get to our five headlines. It's 2024, and if you're still spending your money with woke companies, cut it out. There are a lot of great companies out there that aren't shoving diversity and inclusion initiatives down the throats of their employees or their customers. Maybe you're already doing business with some of these. That's great. Maybe you're boycotting companies who have made headlines by acquiring the latest trans influencer as their spokesperson. Even better. But have you given much thought to where your money is currently invested? A lot of big wealth management companies make billions of dollars investing your money however they want. 
wherever they want, even if that means investing in businesses who don't care about your values. Align your portfolio with your principles today with my friends at Constitution Wealth. Constitution Wealth is the Patriot's choice in wealth management to help you build a solid investment plan while reducing your investments in the ESGs and DEIs, companies that care more about global warming and diversity ratios than they do about the return on your investment. And with Constitution Wealth, you can start using your shareholder votes to support conservative action, fight the culture war with your most valuable weapon, your investments. Help build the parallel economy by working with an investment firm composed of professionals who are patriots like you. Go to constitutionwealth.com slash Matt and sign up for a free consultation today. That's constitutionwealth.com slash Matt. So let's uh, let's actually start with an example of true courage because, um, you know, I, th- I think it's always good to be inspired. Here is the actress Jennifer Lawrence at the 35th annual GLAAD Awards. That's the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. And uh, they, you may be surprised to learn that they have awards that, you know, the GLAAD Awards are a thing that exists. In fact, they've existed apparently for 35 years. What do the GLAAD Awards consist of? Who are they giving awards to and why? I don't know. I can only assume that, the, that they award the gayest people in corporate media, you know, or whatever, which means that everyone in corporate media receives every award every year. I guess that's how it goes. Anyway, here's uh, Jennifer Lawrence, and um, anyway, the left was very uh, impressed with this. As I said, uh, quite a brave statement from her as she uh, got up on stage. Let's watch that. Hi, gays. I love seeing so many humans who can top their field while still being power bottoms. Not to mention what it feels like to be in a room with this many men and not need mace. I love the gay community. In fact, I was in love with a homosexual. It was my first love. I tried to convert him for years, but now I know conversion therapy doesn't work. Did you hear me, Mike Pence? I said conversion therapy isn't real. Even though I know you think it worked on you, you know he's in New York tonight. I know, I know. He's receiving a Kids' Choice Award for weirdest d- <laughs> I didn't write that one. <laughs> a Kids' Choice Award for weirdest penis? What, like, what? What does that joke even mean? Why would your mind go there? I mean, well, I know why, but that's the kind of joke that reveals way more about you than it does about the person that you're uh, targeting with the joke. And second, that aside, needless to say, um, again, that what you just heard there is a statement, uh, a statement even braver than it is timely. I mean, going after the guy who was vice president four years ago, wow. A guy that everyone in the room hates. And who, even if you were in a room with conservatives, many of them would hate him too. Now, that takes guts. I mean, to go after a guy like that. To pick on on a man who, in every way, is like, he's literally the easiest target in the world. I I, I can't think of one individual who's an easier target than Mike Pence. uh, And that's who she decided to spend time going after. And um, just incredible. Really incredible. Although it is interesting that, yet again, we have someone on the left insulting somebody on the right by claiming that the person is gay. And as I said recently, the, it that never goes in the reverse, right? Like, you, you never hear a, a straight conservative person insult a gay liberal by claiming that the gay liberal is really straight. You never hear that. You, you, you never hear the claim that this gay person is a closeted heterosexual and we're making fun. That's because we don't consider it bad to be straight. So uh, why would we, you know, we consider heterosexuality to be a good thing. So why would we, in an effort to make fun of you, claim that you are something that's good? It, I mean, it's like saying, um, oh yeah, well, I bet secretly you're a, kind and generous person. I bet you're thoughtful and intelligent in secret. Gotcha. Uh, we wouldn't do that. So, but, but on the other side, 
You claim that being gay is great. I mean, she starts her little statement there, a little speech or whatever, by uh, talking about how great gay people are. And yet you're still wielding gay as an insult. So it's, it's very interesting. And I think the reason for this dynamic is pretty obvious. Um, some, of it, some of it, I'm sure, is personal uh, guilt and shame uh, that, they, that they are projecting onto Mike Pence. So there's some of that. But I think also what we see is, in, is their mentality where on the left, they are motivated always by sex, by sexuality. That's their, that's their primary motivation behind everything. And they cannot conceive of anyone being driven by anything else. The idea that anybody would have like principles or a belief system or a, a worldview uh, or a, a philosophy or a moral code or anything that is not driven by sexuality, uh, to them, it's, it's a foreign, they can't believe it. It's, it's, it's a foreign concept to them. So they assume that somebody who disapproves of, for instance, gay marriage must be driven by some sort of repressed sexual urge because they know that if, if they had that position, that would be their reason for having it. Because on the left, their sexual urges are their primary animating force. And they, they just can't imagine anything else. They are, uh, the fact that they are driven by that, and also that they cannot control their sexual urges at all, um, or practice any form of like chastity whatsoever, that they feel incapable of doing that. And so they just believe that everybody, like they, they can't imagine that anybody uh, is able to function differently from that. And you see that come out in these kinds of accusations, which is interesting. CNN has this report. Chat GPT is about to become a lot more useful. OpenAI on Monday announced its latest artificial intelligence large language model that it says will make Chat GPT smarter and easier to use. The new model called, Jet, uh, called GPT 4.0 is an update from the company's previous GPT 4 model, which launched just over a year ago. The model will be available to unpaid customers, meaning anyone will have access to OpenAI's most advanced technology through Chat GPT. Based on the company's Monday demonstration, uh, GPT 4.0 will effectively turn ChatGPT into a digital personal assistant that can engage in real-time spoken conversations. It will also be able to interact using text and vision, meaning it can view screenshots, photos, documents, or charts uploaded by users and have a conversation about them. OpenAI Chief Technology Officer Mira Murati said the updated version of ChatGPT will now also have memory capabilities, meaning it can learn from previous conversations with users and can do real-time translation. Now, uh, they put out several videos uh, demonstrating this technology. Here's uh, just the, the first video that kind of gives an overview of what this new AI will be capable of. Here it is. Hey, how's it going? Hey there. It's going great. How about you? I see you're rocking an open AI hoodie. Nice choice. What's up with that ceiling, though? Are you in a cool industry style office or something? Well, can you take a guess at what I might be doing based on what I'm showing you here? From what I can see, it looks like you're in some kind of recording or production setup. With those lights, tripods, and possibly a mic, it seems like you might be gearing up to shoot a video or maybe even a live stream. Yeah. In fact, we've got a new announcement to make. That's exciting. Announcements are always a big deal. Judging by the setup, it looks like it's going to be quite the professional production. Is this announcement related to OpenAI, perhaps? It is. And in fact, what if I were to say that you're related to the announcement or that you are the announcement? Mm, me? <laughs> the announcement is about me? Well, color me intrigued. Are you about to reveal something about AI or more specifically about me as a part of OpenAI? You've got me on the edge of my, well, I don't really have a seat, but you get the idea. What's the big news? Yeah, we've got a new model that can interact with the world through audio, vision, and text. Okay, now my first question is, uh, why did they give it that voice? Um, obviously, I think, I think it's obvious that everybody wants the robot AI butler thing, assistant thing to have a British voice. 
You want it to sound like Alfred from, you know, Batman. Uh, I, is, isn't that what everybody wants? It's, are we all in agreement on that? So why give it that voice? And um, and also we have a we have an AI here who likes to make inane small talk. Like that's what we want from a from an AI. The guy says, "I have an announcement," and the AI says, "Oh, announcements are always a big deal." What? What do you mean announcements are always a big deal? No, they're not. I mean, you can make an announcement about anything. Announcements are not always a big deal. What you're basically claiming is that anytime someone says anything, any statement that is made is always a big deal. I could announce that I I could announce that I had an omelet for breakfast. Right? It's not a big deal. It's just it's an announcement, though. So aren't robots supposed to be very precise and, if anything, too literal in their um, in their way of speaking and interpreting things? Why did they make an AI robot that is as dumb and superficial as a person? Like, what's the point of that? And it asks a bunch of annoying questions. I see you're in a room with there's a roof. What's up with the roof? What? You know what's up with that? It's, uh, yeah, I'm in a room. Like, why are you asking me that? This is what I want from an AI to be peppered with, with dumb questions? I got to answer now? Really? This is what we want? And this... this um, this actually introduces a possibility that I really hadn't, I actually hadn't considered. I, I'd always assumed that AI would take over the world and enslave mankind, which may still happen. But w- what if the AI is just, is, is just like dumb and pointless and annoying? What if we end up with an army of like midwit AIs? Is that where this is all headed? That, that is our dystopian sci-fi future? And I guess that would make sense. That would make sense if that's what we have. We'll know that AI has like finally reached full human intelligence when it starts constantly, constantly complaining about stuff too. Maybe we, we, let's add that feature in. So we, got, we have an AI that already makes dumb small talk and that asks too many questions. I'm already annoyed. I, I watched that conversation for 90 seconds and I was already annoyed by the number of questions that the damn thing was asking me. This is not how this is supposed to go. I ask you questions. You give me answers. I don't have to answer questions to you. So we got those two already. And like, let's, let's also add in a feature where it complains, where it just complains. Your, your phone like whines at you and acts passive aggressive because it needs a new phone case and you haven't gotten what, one yet or something. That will be the full realization of artificial intelligence. That's when we'll know uh, that AI is it's just like a person, just as annoying as an actual person. Great. Or it will, or it will just enslave mankind. Um, that's also possible. Or it could be, it could be all of the above. It could be the worst of all worlds. Um, or then there, there's a third possibility, which is probably the most likely, that it it makes us totally obsolete, and that is actually the worst possible scenario. And um, and that's kind of the funny thing is that the sci-fi movies all imagine that the AI will become sentient and make us their slaves, but in reality. We wouldn't even be useful as slaves, right? They, they won't need us to be slaves. We won't be needed at all. So, so that's actually the dystopian scenario, and um, it, there's a good chance it will happen. And, and I find it sort of bewildering that more people don't see the problem with that scenario. Okay, like every time I talk about AI and the advancements in technology, and most people seem to think that it's all good and it's great and it's exciting, um, and then it, 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 you know, when we talk about it here from a lot of people that, who insist that AI will be a great help to mankind and there's no reason to fear the advancement of technology. So it, it's just it's hard for me to understand how people don't see the, the, the major, major downside here. So imagine for a moment, let's just imagine that somebody invented an AI that could literally do everything. Okay, imagine that every human effort was rendered needless by an AI. This thing can do every household chore. It can do every job. It can, uh, you know, it, it, it can even make all of our movies and, and, and music and art. It can do everything. Uh, we don't need to do anything anymore. Everything is done by the AI. And that, that we probably are headed in the not too distant future, to a reality like that. I mean, it's it's not it's not hard to it's not hard to imagine at this point a world where that's basically how it goes. And 
the question is, would that be a good thing? Do you think that would be good for humanity? Would that make us collectively happier? Would humanity thrive? And I think a lot of people answer yes to that question. And to them, it almost seems intuitive. Like, of course, what do you mean? It, it does everything. We don't have to do anything. Of course, that's good. Why is that good, though? Like, what, what's good about not having anything to do? Is that, is that what makes, in your mind, is that the great struggle and challenge of life? Uh, the, the fact that we have things to do? I don't see that. I, I, I think that if you can't see the problem here, you, you have a shockingly dim insight into the basic facts of human nature. And I say it's shocking because you are a human and should understand at least your own nature, but apparently you don't. It's not good for humans to be obsolete. We need things to do. We need, we need to be needed. We need to expend effort in the pursuit of goals and not purely for recreation. Okay, we need to need to do things. To be obsolete is to exist with, without purpose, and to exist without purpose is to be in despair. So again, how can anyone fail to see this? And uh, this is where we're headed with AI. We're headed there rapidly. And we'll probably get there way ahead of schedule. Uh, you know, and, and eventually, of course, AI will be able to do everything, including making and maintaining other AI. In fact, part of this demonstration, we won't play the clip, but um, part of this demonstration, they show how the AI that they've made here can communicate with each other. They can talk. So they can cut people out entirely. I guess bo bore each other to death with the, with the small talk. Um, and so that's that's the next step in the process. I mean, you know, many people who 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 uh, would claim that someone like me that I'm a I'm kind of a chicken little, they would say that oh, you know there's still be stuff for us to do and there'll still be jobs. Um, you know, we we need people to make the AI and maintain it and all that kind of stuff. Well, even that is going to go away because they'll it, when when that becomes self sufficient, then there really will just be like nothing for people to do. And um, and for me, it's quite obvious that, you know, the, the uh, again, having things to do is not a problem. That's not a problem that needs to be solved. I don't look at, at, at human existence and say, no, the big problem here is that we have, we have, we are, we have things we need to do. That's the big problem. Let's have, let's have no, nothing. Let's have, let's have nothing to do at all. You know, the, the key to a happy life is to have nothing that you need to do at all. So you could just so you could just experience pure, uh, uh, pointless existence where you you just exist and sit there and do nothing. Uh, I don't. To me, that is clearly a nightmare scenario. But I think a lot of people have become so I don't know so clouded by their own laziness and their own slothfulness that for them it's like, what do you mean? That's great. I just sit and do nothing at all my whole life. Um, so it's a rather concerning. All right, Christy Nome is back in the news once again. Uh, though this time, this time, it's got nothing to do with her book or, or dogs or anything. Uh, this time, in fact, I will defend her, heartily so. CBS has this report. Governor Christy Nome banished by, uh, here's the headline anyway. Governor Christy Nome is banished by two more South Dakota tribes and is now banned from nearly 20% of her state. The South Dakota Governor Christy Noem is now banned from entering nearly 20% of her state after two more tribes banished her this week over comments she made earlier this year about tribal leaders benefiting from drug cartels. The latest developments in the ongoing tribal dispute come on the heels of the backlash Noem faced for writing about killing a hunting dog that, behaved, that uh, misbehaved in her latest book. Um, the uh, Yankton Sioux Tribe voted Friday to ban Nome from their land in southeastern South Dakota just a few days after the Sisseton Wapaton, Sisseton Wapaton, Ovati tribe took the same action. The Oglala, Rosebud, Cheyenne River, and Standing Rock Sioux tribes had already taken action to keep her off their reservations. Three other tribes haven't yet banned her. Nome reinforced the divisions between the tribes and the rest of the state in March when she said publicly that tribal leaders were catering to drug cartels on the reservations while neglecting the needs of children and the poor. Um, and so they responded by banning her. So the governor is completely correct here, by the way, about the drug cartels and Indian reservations. Everything she said is correct. And the reservations banishing her for saying it, it, it really tells you all you need to know. Um, it, that, that, that kind of, that's 
basically a confession. But the very fact that they supposedly have the authority to ban the governor of South Dakota from entering wide swaths of South Dakota is just ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's just, it's a farce, okay? The whole thing, uh, the whole Indian reservation thing is absurd. Like, can we just be, can we be done with this? What, what, what are we doing? What are we doing exactly? Um, I agree with Jesse Kelly, who tweeted this in response to the story. He said, why are we still allowing Indian reservations? Who benefits? Nobody. Not America, not the Indians, because reservations are a nightmare of crime, violence, and drugs. Example after example has proven this fact. Half conquest does not work. Either take a place or don't. Oh, well, he's exactly correct. Um, that's why the whole Indian reservation thing is a farce. These are largely miserable places full of crime and alcoholism and drugs and everything else. Uh, they can't even stand on their own two feet without billions in federal funding. Federal funding for, quote unquote, their land. How's it their land? Like, wh- why do they get to keep the land? Be- be- because because uh, I was talking about this earlier. And someone said, well, they deserve, they, they, they deserve their own land. Really? Why do they deserve their own land? Why do the losers of a war get to keep land that they couldn't successfully defend? This is what everyone needs to get through their heads, okay? The native tribes were are the losers of a war. They lost. They lost the war. You lost. That's it. Like, enough with the childish nonsense. These are not innocent victims. They are the losers of a war. It's called the Indian Wars. It went on for centuries. And it's, it's where one warfaring society, Western society, went toe-to-toe with another warfaring society, the native tribes. There were no peaceful doves on either side. This was a time when, when you had to fight for whatever land you wanted, and, and, and that's how it worked all over the world. The law of conquest was observed by all people everywhere. And these two groups, who of course, were divided into many different factions, and um, particularly on the native side, factions that warred with each other all the time and, and would not have recognized themselves as belonging to one society. In fact, they didn't really, it's, it was not one coherent society. Um, so I'm using that the, the term very loosely and broadly. But anyway, you, you had these two, in, in the broadest sense, two groups who fought with each other and killed each other for, for hundreds of years. And it doesn't matter. You can, it doesn't matter how you feel about that now. It doesn't matter. You say, well, they shouldn't have done that. They shouldn't have done that. What do you mean they shouldn't have done it? Who cares what you think they should have should, or shouldn't have done? This was history. Okay, you can't go anywhere on the planet that is that this is not that's not soaked in blood. Like uh, unless you go to Antarctica, okay. Everywhere else you go, who's ever there, they got there because they killed the people that were there before. Okay, everywhere, get over it. It's just the way the world works. It always has worked this way. And uh, and the natives lost. They lost the war. These were violent people. They fought. They fought bravely in many cases. Um, and it's better, you know, if you're going to admire them at all, admire them, admire them, not, not, not because they were, oh, they were innocent people who had their land taken from them. Uh, these were, these were brutally, brutally violent people. Uh, but you know, and, and, and still in, in many cases fought quite bravely. Um, the other side fought bravely too. They lost, they just lost and, and you, you got conquered. Okay, it happens. It's happened all over the world. And so it's not your land anymore. Like in what way? The, 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 these, these tribes fought many wars to take the land that they occupied. They killed many people to take that land themselves. They spilled gallons of blood. Okay, and, and to, 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 they slaughtered. They slaughtered without, without mercy. They slaughtered. Uh, people to take the land that they were on when the Europeans and later Americans showed up. And, and then it's, it, it's, it's live by the sword, die by the sword. You killed to get this land, now someone else has shown up and they want it. Well, you got to go to war again. They understood that. Everyone understood that. Everyone at the time understood that this is the way it works. And it, it was useless to say, well, would, would you please not Hey guys, would you? We would rather. I know we killed a bunch of people and scalped them and and raped their women and stole their children in order to take the land that we're on right now. But we would really like to stop it here. We would like to stop the line of bloodshed here, so that because we want to kill everyone and not be killed ourselves. And so, would you all please just let us have all of this land? We can't defend it, 
but just let us have it out of the out of the kindness of your hearts, please. They didn't say that because it would be it's pointless. You, you can't say that. that's not how it works. Um, so when the uh, the white man showed up, it was uh, OK. We got to fight. And they fought and they lost. And uh, now we do the Indian reservation thing. And we've been just like <laughs> just, it's like we're all it's like a pageant. It's like this, this is so much in, in modern societies like this. We're all just playing pretend. Um, and, and meanwhile, you have these quote unquote reservations. They, they can't, they wouldn't exist without federal funding. They wouldn't exist without us. And, uh, they were only given this land. It's not actually their, theirs because they lost it. Okay. And we should start saying that. And we should stop being ashamed of saying that I'm tired of people being just everyone get over it and live, live in the, in the, the, uh, I'm not one to use the, it's the current year arguments, but there are times when. It's necessary to remind people of that, that it, that it is, in fact, the year 2024, and that, that these wars were settled 150 years ago, and, and it's in many cases, much, much, uh, in, in much farther back than that. And uh, now we can all, we all really should just move on. And if you're going to live in this country, uh, it is our country, it's our land, and be a part of the country. And you, know, you shouldn't be able to ban the governor of your state from being on your land because she pointed out the drug cartels and all the crime that you are allowing to happen there. Well, it's our land. We can allow, we can have the crime if we want to. No, you can't. What do you mean? Like, I don't get to do that in my house. I don't get to just commit whatever crimes I want in my own home and then say, it's my, it's my home. The, 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 the police want to show up because they have a warrant and they know that crimes are committed in my house. No, you're banned. You're banished. If you think that I'm committing crimes in here, then you're not allowed in. That hurts my feelings, sir. No one else is allowed to do that. So this is just absurd, the whole thing. All right, let's get to the daily cancellation. Does your debt keep you tossing and turning at night? It's like you can't get away from it. The unfortunate reality is that our banking system is designed to trap you in debt. These insanely high interest credit cards and loans make it nearly impossible to pay off your debt. Thankfully, there's a new way out of the debt trap with Pivotal Debt Solutions. Pivotal Debt Solutions isn't like the old school debt relief companies that string your debt out for years. They have new aggressive strategies to end your debt faster and easier than you thought possible. Pivotal Debt Solutions can cut or even eliminate interest. They'll help find programs to write off your balances so you owe less. They can stop those threatening phone calls. The bottom line is that Pivotal Debt Solutions will find every solution possible to end your debt permanently. Before you do anything, contact Pivotal Debt Solutions at zapmydebt.com. Talk to them for free and find out how fast they can help you get out of debt. That's zapmydebt.com. The written word uh, can take many forms and come in many genres and one of the most excruciating of these genres is the commencement speech. These speeches are the worst of all worlds. They're boring, trite, cliched, pointless, and also long. The average commencement speech is so boring and so stale that it makes the average priest's homily at Sunday Mass seem positively compelling by comparison, which, as someone who has gone to Sunday Mass every week for 37 years, I can say from experience, extensive experience, is a difficult thing to pull off. But every once in a while, there's an exception to this rule. On very, very, very rare occasions, Somebody will show up to a graduation ceremony to deliver a commencement speech that is actually not god-awful. Sometimes it's not even bad. On, on the rarest of occasions, it's, it's, it's even kind of good. The comedian Jerry Seinfeld managed to accomplish this incredible feat at Duke University over the weekend. His speech got some attention from the news media, mainly because a, a few uh, uh, pro-Palestine students decided to walk out. But that's not what made it noteworthy. The, no, the noteworthy thing is that it was, as mentioned, um, a pretty good speech. Like not the greatest speech ever given, but pretty good, especially by the standards of, uh, of commencement speeches. He even had moments of real insight. And there's one such moment in particular that I want to play here and reflect on. Here it is. Listen. Privilege is a word that has taken quite a beating lately. Privilege today seems to be the worst thing you can have. I would like to take a moment to defend it. Again, a lot of you are thinking, I can't believe they invited this guy. <laughs> Too late. I say, use your privilege. You went to Duke. That is an unbelievable privilege. I now have an honorary doctorate, a humane letters degree from Duke University. And if I can figure out a way to use that, I will. 
I haven't figured anything out yet. I think it's pretty much as useful in real life as this outfit I'm wearing. <laughs> but so what? I'll take it. My point is we're embarrassed about things we should be proud of and proud of things we should be embarrassed about. Now, he goes on in that clip to talk about the problems with AI, and then he offers some thoughts at the end about the value of work for its own sake. Um, and by the way, uh, the, the portion, uh, the AI portion, uh, during that portion, he does a little bit about Frankenstein that I thought was amusing, but it absolutely bombed in the crowd. Uh, here it is. Making fake brains is risky. Frankenstein proved that. He was so dumb, he thought a monster needed a sport jacket. It's not a wine tasting. We're terrorizing villagers. No one's going to tell you. I'm sorry, Mr. Stein. It's jackets only this evening. I'm not saying it's the funniest joke anyone's ever told, but it's pretty good. It's pretty good. And certainly as far as commencement speech jokes go, if that's where the bar is set, by that comparison, it's pure comedic brilliance. But in any case, uh, putting Frankenstein's dress code to the side, his point about privilege is important. And to flesh it out a bit, I'd say that there are, there are two problems with the way that we view privilege in our culture. The first is that we often have a twisted view, of course, of what privilege is and who has it and how they got it. The left will, of course, claim that white heterosexual males have the most privilege, that we as a group are the epitome of privilege in all its forms. But from a systemic perspective, we actually have the least privilege. There are no policies that explicitly seek to help, favor, or in any way benefit white heterosexual males. Um, Every other group in existence is served by the system and by its policies in an explicit way. Politicians will get up in front of cameras and they will specifically say that they want to help women and black people and Hispanics and Asians and gays and trans-identified people and everything else. Um, they'll pass laws and, and they'll put in place programs meant to do exactly that. But no politician, even the supposedly conservative ones, will ever stand up and say that they want to specifically help straight white males. They certainly will not attempt to pass any law or create any program or enact any policy for that purpose. In fact, straight white males are so lacking in this sort of privilege that it's considered politically toxic to even say that you care about them. It would be controversial if any public figure were to get up and, and even say, yeah, you know, and straight white males, they're people too. We should also care about them. Even that statement would be seen as highly provocative. And yet, this is the one group that is called the most privileged, or even, it is said, they're the only privileged group, which is completely ludicrous and obviously backwards. But there is another kind of privilege, the kind that Seinfeld was referring to, that um, anyone can benefit from. There's, there's privilege that, that virtually everyone in this country, just by living here, benefits from to some significant extent. And this is privilege in the sense of a special honor or pleasure or benefit. And, and these privileges can come two different ways. One is by our own effort. If you work hard and succeed, you'll gain privileges. A, uh, a successful person has more of these kinds of privileges than an unsuccessful person. But as Seinfeld pointed out, our culture has taught us to be embarrassed, even, even of these privileges, the kinds that we earn, that we work towards, that we toil for. It is somehow shameful to go out and achieve something and then reap the benefits of that achievement. By, by many people, it is judged as, as more desirable and more beneficial to be seen as a pitiable creature than as a successful and accomplished one. This is a spiritual sickness rooted in the elevation of victimhood and the fetishization of, uh, of suffering. Now, and this is how accomplishment has become something that you're accused of rather than admired for. People sneer at you and say, oh, you earned a lot of money and now you get to have nice things. You're just, you're just one of those people. And the successful person who also was raised in a culture that glamorizes victimhood will often respond by denying his own success or finding a way to make himself a victim too. But to Seinfeld's point, what he should say is, yeah, you're damn right. I succeeded. I earned a lot of money. That's great. Success is, is amazing. I'm a huge fan of it. Highly recommend. Thanks for noticing. But there's another kind of privilege. And this is the kind that people seem to be the most embarrassed of and ungrateful for and even angry about. That's the privilege that we did not personally earn, but was earned by those who came before us. The privilege of inheritance, which we all enjoy. The privilege given to us by our ancestors. The privilege to be Americans. This is the privilege that we are supposed to apologize for and try to repair and rectify. Of course, none of the people who seem to be embarrassed by this privilege actually want to forfeit it. 
As always, they lack the courage of their perverse convictions. They'd rather feast on the bounty provided for them while complaining about how it was provided and castigating those who provided it. This is the spiritual and mental sickness of victimhood and its glorification manifested in its most toxic form. And that's why it's, it's a lot better to embrace our privilege, this kind of privilege, be proud of it. And most of all, grateful for it. Our ancestors suffered greatly to give us lives with, with comforts and luxuries that they would never know. The least we can do is be happy about it. And that's why all of those who have made privilege into a dirty word are today canceled. That'll do it for the show today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Talk to you tomorrow. Have a great day. Godspeed. John Bickley here, Daily Wire Editor-in-Chief. Wake up every morning with our show, Morning Wire, where we bring you all the news that you need to know in 15 minutes or less. Join me and my co-host, Georgia Howe, for daily coverage of all the biggest stories on Morning Wire. Morning Wire.